earlier, and I guess I didn't want to hear what I had to say, and then Jeff's heard what I had to say and didn't want to hear it again. I guess that's what it is. Is that right, Jeff? <laughs> it's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? And um, my spirit is uh, going up a little today because I looked at the temperature. It's supposed to be up in the 50s. No snow, no ice. What do you think? <laughs> no, I hate snow. And, um, but if you had a lane like mine, and don't say anything, Jeff, because I know. You remind me nobody told me to build on top of a hill. If you, you had a lane like mine, you wouldn't like it either. Um, but that's another thing altogether. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, particularly as we begin, quite frankly, we begin the new church year. It begins this Sunday, Advent. We move into the season of Advent. And it's, I don't know if it's a season we uh, talk enough about, uh, but I, I really appreciate that the Church of Antiquity, in its wisdom, really established this period called Advent as we move on toward the um, holiday, the, the Holy Day. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke myself. I don't call it a holiday. I believe Christmas is a holy day, like Easter is a holy celebration in the church. But the, the church in its wisdom established this period for a reason. And, and, and then the church, the wisdom of the church uh, of antiquity asks us to, um, I don't know, pay attention or to live into what, what has been called for. And that is, first of all, that Advent, this period prior to Christmas, is a period that we might actually spend uh, some time to look internal to ourselves, introspection. It calls us, it, it, it sets a time to call us to say, let's be more specific now than perhaps a lot of the periods of the, of the year. But it's a, it's a serious and a needful call, in, I think, in the world in which we live in, because quite frankly, there are not a lot of people who, are, um, who understand what it means to go internal, to be introspective, to uh, understand who we are, and particularly because it's the Christian church, who we are in light of Almighty God. That's the guiding principle. It's not just who am I, it's who am I as a creature of Almighty God in light of that. It's a season that we are called then not only for introspection, but it's a season we are also called to um, spend some time getting quiet, getting quiet before Almighty God. It's a season that reminds us that, that if you go back uh, and look in the Old Testament, you look at the New Testament, go back and look at the Old Testament, you go forward and look at Revelation as well, that, that there is this, this, um, this cry from God to get his people to slow down in our breakneck speed world. Slow down. This is a season. Do you believe it? Season leading up to Christmas, as hectic as it gets for us, that, that the Church of Antiquity says, no, this isn't a time to get m more busy or busier. This is a time to slow down and reflect. And as I said, um, it's very, very difficult for us because of the speed of our society anymore that most people I talk to, at least my age, um, I, it's older than many of you, uh, tell me that if I slow down and sit down, I go to sleep. That's the problem. That's true, isn't it? But it says something if that's the case. It says something about the, our hectic life before Almighty God. And what we're called to, however, is the call of the Bible, slow down and know that I am God. That's the call, slow down and know that I am God. Be silent before Almighty God. And, and that's what this season uh, um, really calls us to, to slow down, to be silent before Almighty God so that we might actually hear 
that, that clear, small voice of Almighty God. But further, it, it is to get us, once we have reflected backwards in, in Advent and, and remember the mighty act of God in this season of Christmas, the incarnation, to, un, to reflect on what is the incarnation, what does it mean to say, Christ is God on earth. I'm not sure we reflect on that at all. We, we look at the story, but in looking at the story, I think it overwhelms where we're supposed to be. What does it mean to say incarnation? We all say it. What does it mean to say this is God on earth? To reflect on that and what it possibly means for us today but looking back and understanding that is then to cast our vision forward. This is the season of Advent. To cast our vision forward in, in great anticipation of uh, the second promise, second coming of Christ. It's a season really filled with uh, intention of where we should be. And when we apply that in our lives, it's a season then that helps us move more uh, spiritually, I guess I should say, more spiritually through uh, this time of year that tends to be ultra, ultra busy in the lives that we live in. Excuse me. So I, I ask that as we move through Advent, we try to keep these things in mind and try to be perhaps a little bit more intentional because that is, that process is part of the process of growing deeper in the Lord. If the criticism is right that the church of Jesus Christ is a mile wide but only an inch thick or an inch deep, that's the, that's the criticism that we've reached broadly but that have not grown deeply. If, it is, if that criticism is true, this process is set up to help us um, kind of grow deeper in the divine God. And, and so that's what the process of Ad, Advent is all about. And as we begin today, I want to talk about then this, this uh, promise of Almighty God, kind of borrowing from Luke, but also more clearly uh, talking about the prophecy from uh, Micah as we move into this season. This is the season that it was kind of begun, Luke at least begins here, begins with the decree of uh, Caesar to um, have all the world registered. Now, if you know anything about history, you know that this registration of Caesar is certainly not the first registration of a people that has ever happened. You can find it in non-biblical history, you can find it in biblical history as well. Uh, rulers, kings, despots particularly, seem to like to count things. And they seem to particularly like to count their money. Sometimes, as in the decree of Caesar, sometimes they like to count their people but usually, as was the case of Caesar, they like to count their people so that they can know the tax base, so that they can kind of predict um, what counting they can do of their money. We know that through history that these types of rulers really do believe that they are the movers of history. And if you know anything about the Roman Empire at all, you know that particularly from Caesar on, they truly did believe that they were the movers of history, the creators, uh, the determiners of all that went on. In fact, with Caesar, Caesar is the first one who really begins to get the people to try to worship him as some kind of god. He can move everything around. And in some sense, if we look at, at the control he had, we understand maybe why, uh, why his arrogance at all. Because we know that, and the average Roman, and the average Israeli knew this, that, that um, Caesar controlled the, the most of, if not all of, the known world. 
Now we know now, as we look back at history, we know that that was the world from um, England over to Mesopotamia, and a slice right through there. Um, not the entire world, but for the people of the time, it was the known world. And so when Caesar uh, implies that he is some sign of God, the maker of history, then uh, most of the people believe that as well. That is why, uh, particularly when we read the scripture on Christmas Eve, the scripture of Luke's story of the birth of Jesus, that is why Luke begins the way he does begin. Caesar has made the claim. Most of the people in the world around them believe the claim that he is the great mover of history. Luke wants to tell us that, you know what? Caesar says he's the great mover of history, but I want to tell you about a, uh, the true mover of history. So Luke is, is written as a, a, a direct, if you will, protest against what the world already believes and uses even the emperor, the office, to show that. Furthermore, Luke wants us to know something, who this, this great mover of history is. He wants us to know a couple of things, very basic about it. Number one, he wants us to know that the story of Christ is not a fable. That, that they can, in fact, through study, they can, they can situate the birth of Christ in time and history, in place and time and history. When does Christ come? Christ comes when Caesar set out and said, uh, I want to register the entire world. That's when this takes place. And Luke wants to do that so that we begin to understand that the kings and emperors and despots who lift themselves up as the mighty people that create and make and move the world around are, in fact, nothing more than um, people who self-aggrandize or self-aggrandize, that they are people who have a rather arrogant view of themselves so that they don't have any need to consider that there might be something or someone more powerful than they are. And Luke is drawing then from the prophet we want to look at this morning, Micah, and, and so let's join the prophet here. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. You know what? As I've always said, as I've already said, Caesar, and if you, again, if you study history, from this point forward, it becomes even worse than uh, with Augustus. They really did believe that they were... Um, they were, in a sense, gods themselves. So they created history. They made history. The world moved as they wanted the world to move. But uh, Micah suggests Caesar did not know something, know something that was really, really, really important. He suggests to us that while Caesar thinks he is an independent agent in the world, while Caesar thinks that he has moved to register the people because he's wanted to do that, while Caesar thinks that he can uh, build the world up or tear the world down, Caesar did not know, according to Micah, that he was nothing more than a tool of Almighty God. Caesar thinks he has decided all of this stuff, but Micah wants us to know that prior to this arrogant Augustus, God has already chosen the history that will be. Now, I want to be clear on this. I, I believe in free will. I do not believe in determinism. But despite that, I believe that God is able to affect what God intends to be affected. Amen? I'm, I'm not really willing to say how. What marvels me, however, is, is that God seems to use humankind, fallible, sometimes the evil 
God seems to use that which is on the playing board, if you will, uh, in a way to, to nevertheless affect what God intends. So Caesar, he's moving people around so that he can count more money, but he doesn't know that he seems to be moving people around so that the prophetic word will in fact come true. He's moving people around, and what happens? According to the Bible, he moves people around to try to count them in such a way so that the prophetic word that Jesus will be born, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, in fact comes true. Caesar thinks he's, he is controlling, he's making history, but he has in fact only been a tool of Almighty God. Caesar does not know that there was a greater decree than the decree that he sent out. And that greater decree, according to Micah, is this, is that God was in the process of doing something that would marvel everyone. And here is, here is the key, if you will, or the cue that this is taking place. What will happen is, is that this great um, Messiah of God will be born in Bethlehem. So Caesar's decree only seems to be able to move people around to get them where Micah says that they will already be. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. Micah wants not only Caesar and the people at Caesar's time to know something, he wants us to know something as well. And that is this. It is God who is the great mover of history. It is not any Caesar. It is not any despotic ruler. And, and, and where that perhaps impacts us today, it is not even the only real empire left. I'm not sure I agree with that, but you hear it all the time on the news that the other great powers have fallen and America has, is left on, on the playing board, if you will. I'm not sure I really agree with that, but nevertheless, we are a, a massive power in this world. And it would be good for us to understand that we are not the maker or mover of history either according to the Bible. That's a hard one for us to get our minds around who we are, and I acknowledge that, and I don't want to make more out of it than it is. It's hard for us, but if we, if we take a moment and step back and ask ourselves, where, where, as we look at this story of God unfolding, where are we in the story? And because the truth of the matter is, if we place ourselves in the story of God's activity in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not the powerless Israel. We are not the little nation where other nations are controlling us. If we place ourselves in the picture here, then we have to acknowledge we are the power that makes us Rome, that puts us in the position where it's easy for us to lose the concept or the, or the belief or the understanding that maybe, maybe we are not the creators of history. Maybe, like in the time of Rome, we are tools, we are actors in this great scheme as well. That there is a greater power over us that controls the history of which we tend to forget from time to time. But the amazing thing about this story is this, that Micah wanted the people to understand, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure they did not get it, but I'm not so sure we do not get it either. Because as Israel looked for this great movement of the divine God, as they looked for this Messiah that was promised, they began to look for a Messiah that looked an awful lot like the powerful Roman emperor. At the very least, he looked an awful lot like the um, emperor, if you will, that they understood, King David. David, that great military ruler, 
that, that ruler that kind of finally threw off all of the enemies and in some way got the tribes of Israel all together so that he created the most powerful nation, at least at that time, which was Israel. And, and so as they looked for Messiah, they understood Messiah as a ruler that could control things and had the power to move things around just like the emperor in their time and day did. But, but even before the time of Jesus, the prophet says, you need to understand something, however. God's going to act in a way that, that will just kind of mess you all up. He is not going to come as another David or another Caesar or some kind of strong man ruler. That, in fact, this, this Messiah is going to come in a way that doesn't serve the self, as rulers tend to do, but in a way that, that empties the self. This ruler is going to come and show us something that it's hard to get our minds around, that this most powerful being in the entire universe, entire cosmos, is going to show his power in love, not in war. That the power of God that is displayed in this Messiah will be God's love. And it is love that overcomes it is not military, it's not guns. That this Messiah will not wear a crown of, of laurel leaves like the emperor does, or a crown like David did, but this person coming, this incarnation, this Messiah of God, will instead wear a crown of thorns. That, that God's love for us will come in a way that this Messiah will suffer from the rulers of this world. This Messiah will suffer from uh, the, the evil. This Messiah will die at the hands of that for a particular reason, that this God is going to come and show us what ultimate love is all about and what ultimate love will, in fact, purchase. And ultimate love is not about lording it over others. It is about serving others. And that the accomplishment will be not just the freeing of the physical bodies, which Israel really wanted from the hated Romans, but it will be freedom from the power of sin and freedom from the power of evil. But in the earliest church, very particularly, it was freedom from the power of death. Now, that does not mean, and I want to be clear on that, that does not mean, as I think I believed early on, why, why did we still die if, if Christ uh, defeated the power of death? It, there seems to be some inconsistency there. It doesn't mean that we don't die. It means this, that prior to Christ, uh, there was hardly a notion, it was beginning to develop, but there was hardly any notion that there was any existence beyond the grave at all. Therefore, the power of death was the greatest power that the people um, dealt with. It was final. It was nothingness. But the church understood that what happened is, is that in the death and resurrection of Christ, the power of death itself was canceled because in that gift of eternal life is the resurrection of the soul. Amen? In that power of Almighty God canceled death in that it was that power that controlled all things, darkness, nothingness. Instead of darkness and nothingness, there is light in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is existence in the presence of Almighty God. There is the presence of which uh, we all hope for and long for and is the outcome of our faith in that same Lord Jesus Christ. But if Caesar felt his decree was that which could make history and move history, and if Michael wants us to know that there was a more powerful decree before that, there is a decree that I think that we tend not pay as much attention to. And that's the Christ decree for his church. And that decree is this, that we are to go and to make disciples. This whole salvation thing is not something for us to be glad that we have received 
and do nothing with. We are called, and not, not called, we are sent, as in a decree from Jesus himself, to take that which has been given to you by no effort of your own, by the effort only of Almighty God, by God's will and God's desire, to take that into the world so that we might be a part of the kingdom of God, kingdom building, that we might be a part of that which creates a great multitude of witnesses in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.